like they could save you a lot of time and just say I'm a Catholic hack writer, which is what I really am. That's like the fancy way the publishers make me sound like more. Um, all right, so I thought we could start tonight with a show of hands. I want everyone who, when they were a little girl, dreamed of writing a book about being single when they grew up to raise their hand. Yeah, you notice my hand's not up either. You know, believe it or not, you know, writing a book about being single was not on my top 10 list of things I want to do before I die. Uh, mostly because being single long enough to be considered an expert on the topic was not one of my life's goals. But also because singleness is such a personal topic. You know, it's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to write about. And I am not always the poster child for, you know, the saying happy single life. I do okay. No one asks you to write a book about being single if you're a total mess. Um, but I have my share of struggles with it too. And on the days when I'm struggling, trust me, the last thing I want to do is write about it or go out and talk about it. So why did I write a book? I'm not allowed to say drugs or insanity. My publishers told me that that didn't work anymore. So I'm going to tell you a story instead. And it's about my little goddaughter, Hayden. And Hayden's two, but she is wise beyond her years. Uh, a few weeks back, her mom was out in the living room and Hayden was in the bathroom with their dad getting the bath. And Lindsay could tell that Hayden was playing a game, but she wasn't sure what it was. She just knew that Hayden was getting really frustrated. So she figured she better go check things out, make sure Tim's, you know, not causing any trouble. And she gets in there and she discerns that Hayden is playing wedding. But in her two-year-old little head, for reasons unbeknownst to Lindsay, things weren't going according to plan. So Lindsay asks Hayden to explain, well, what's wrong, honey? And Hayden says, I'm ready. I'm waiting. But my man being pokey. <laughs> Lindsay's like, oh, he's being pokey. Okay. So she, she goes, well, sweetheart, why is he being pokey? And Hayden said, I don't know. I think he doesn't know what to wear. And then she shrugged her shoulders and said, I think I need a new one. <laughs> telling you two years old and she's like tapped into the mindset of the modern single woman you know there's a whole lot of us who are ready and we're waiting but our man is being so darn pokey um you know all of us lucky us uh live in really a culturally unprecedented time more and more people are delaying marriage until later and later in life now the good news if you believe the statistics, is that most of us will eventually get married. You know, our guy will figure out what he wants to wear and he'll come around. We won't have to keep on waiting. Uh, but the statistics also say most of us you know, are going to be waiting longer than we thought we would, uh, longer than our mothers and grandmothers often thought we would. So the question becomes, how do we wait? You know, what do we do in the meantime? How do we deal with all of the questions that come up about career and dating and friendship and finances? Questions that our moms and grandmas who got married at 22 or 18 didn't have to deal with. Um, the answer to those questions matter. They matter a lot. Uh, singleness isn't something we live in a vacuum. You know, the, the decisions that we make now, the attitudes and habits that we cultivate now, those are going to have a profound effect on us for the rest of our life. You know, they'll have an effect on the types of men we marry and the types of marriages into which we enter. They're going to have an effect on the types of wives and mothers we become. They're either going to put us on a path that leads us closer to God, or they're going to put us on a path that leads us away from God. And that is the long answer to why I wrote the book. Um, I wanted to, as I told Mary Rose out there, take one for the team. You know, I would take a look at what the church has to say about the questions that are on our plate right now, and then try to break that down and apply it in really practical ways for single women. Um, and the church actually does have a lot to say. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it because it's not all neatly collected in an encyclical. You know, married people have their own encyclical and priests and religious have their own encyclical, but we don't have an encyclical. Uh, so you have my book, which is a very sorry excuse for an encyclical and not magisterial at all. But at least it collects a lot of the church's wisdom in one volume. Uh, I was trying to decide what to talk about tonight. There's so much to go into. So what I'm gonna stick with are what I've been calling my three foundational principles for staying sane and happy during the single years. Um, again, like I am not the poster child for the single life. I have more than my share of struggles, but 
I would say these three things over the past 10 years that I've actively been thinking with the church have been the things that have uh, fucked me up when I've been struggling and they have kept me from making a lot more mistakes than I could have. So you're not coincidentally, they don't just help with your single life, they help with your married life as well. So those are kind of what I'm going to focus on when I talk about the book tonight. Um, so those three principles. The first is that holiness, not a husband, is the goal of our life. The second, that God has something for us to do right now, and he expects us to do it and do it well. And the third is that the means for joy in life are always sufficient. So foundational principle number one, holiness, not a husband, is the goal of our life. Um, I'm guessing all of you know that, which is why you're here. You know, I had to talk about the Catholic Girls Survival Guide. Um, you know that God made you for himself. You know, he didn't make you just to be a wife or just to be a mother or to be a doctor or a lawyer or a hill rat or whatever it is. You know, God made you to be holy, to be a saint. And everything in this life, every relationship, every job we take on, every opportunity that comes our way is meant to get us where God wants us to go. You know, it's meant to make us holy. Marriage is no exception to that. At its core, marriage is a saint-making game. You know, your job is to get your husband to heaven. His job is to get you to heaven. And it's hard, but it's effective. Um, again, you know that. There are all sorts of beautiful women in this room right now. And if all you wanted were any marriage to anyone, I'm guessing most of you could be married right now. You know, or you could go out and I'm sure there's plenty of guys you could scare up in DC. You know, if all you're looking for is a husband, there is a guy out there who will marry you. I promise you that. Um, but that's not what you want. You know, you don't want any marriage to any guy. Like you want the right marriage to the right guy. You want a guy who's going to love you and respect you and who's going to be a help, not a hindrance in your journey to God. That's a good thing. You know, that's the right thing. That's the right goal. But it's, not always easy to remember that goal. Um, there's temptations from within and temptations from without that can cause us to think maybe we need to flip the priorities and get the husband first and then we'll worry about the holiness thing afterwards. Uh, the temptations come from within because singleness for all the great opportunities it brings is hard. It can be lonely and frustrating, and there's hormones, and there's a biological clock, and all of that together can make you think, you know, done with this. I'm just going to go find a man, and somehow we'll get him to be Catholic. Uh, yeah. Then there's the temptations from without that say pretty much the same thing. You know, they're often from well-meaning friends and relatives who look at us and think, oh, you would make such a great wife and mother. It's such a shame that you're not yet living this vocation. Maybe it's time to stop being so picky. You know, the stop being so picky. Should we listen to them? The answer is sometimes. You know, it all depends on what they mean by being picky. If they're telling us to compromise our lists or are they asking us to compromise our standards? Um, I'm going to break down the difference here. Lists are what you take with you to the grocery store. You know, they're what tell you, I need to buy chicken breasts and Brussels sprouts and eggs. Lists are great when you go to the grocery store. You know, super, super handy or else you're going to forget the Brussels sprouts. Um, lists are not so handy when you're trying to discern what men you want to date and marry. You know, you may think that you want to marry a man who is six foot tall and looks like Tom Welling and reads C.S. Lewis and prays the Liturgy of the Hours, but God might have something entirely different in mind for you. you know, I think it, historically the Israelites are a great example of this. You know, they were ready and waiting for that Messiah. You know, they were ready for him to come. And they knew exactly what he was going to look like. He was going to be a big, bad warrior king who was going to come in and show the Roman overlords what was up. And they were so focused on that list that they didn't notice the Messiah standing right in front of them. You know, he didn't measure up to all the items they had on their checklist. And your husband probably is not going to either. You know, he's not going to look like what you thought you wanted. He might not even look like what you thought you needed. Um, and so that's why lists are a bad idea. You kind of got to set them aside and trust that God knows better than you what, you know, what's right for you. So lists, bad. We save those for the grocery store. Uh, standards are different. Standards are also good at the grocery store. 
You know, they tell us, are the Brussels sprouts moldy? Are the chicken breasts filled with hormones? Did the eggs come from a place where there was salmonella poisoning last week? You know, standards are good. They help us evaluate the quality of what we're looking at. They do the same thing when it comes to dating. You know, standards tell us if the guys that we're thinking about going out with or going out with are men who are capable of entering into a healthy Christian marriage. Um, one of the really fun things when you write a book about being single is that men decide online they're going to debate the reasons why you're still single. Uh, and when they do it on Valentine's Day, it's even more fun, let me tell you. Uh, so yeah, on Valentine's Day, I did an article for National Review. Well, I did an interview for National Review. And for some reason, the comm boxes, a couple of guys got on and went back and forth. And the consensus was my standards were too high, which is really funny because I didn't talk at all about my standards in the article. <laughs> like my standards, my life, my personal history, nothing came up. Uh, but that's okay because it's given me a way to talk about what my standards are now when I go out and talk about the book. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you what my standards are, and you guys can decide if they're you know, crazy and reasonable. Uh, well, first, he has to be free to marry in the church. That just sort of goes without saying. That's a universal standard. Uh, then I want to date a guy who doesn't expect me to commit a mortal sin before marriage or after marriage. So chastity beforehand, openness to life afterwards. I want to date a man who respects my faith and is willing to help me raise our children in the faith. And, well, you know, then good, kind, decent, doesn't beat me, hardworking, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, not, you know nothing, nothing too fancy, doesn't bore me, I suppose I should add that. Um, so unreasonable standards, reasonable, yeah, pretty reasonable, I would think. You know, nothing is nothing's insane there. But there are lots of people in the culture who think, you know, that's crazy high to expect to get a guy who's going to be you know, willing to date chastely and who will stay open to life and not contracept. Um, and in our culture, it has become kind of crazy high. It's not. You know, it's, it's re they are reasonable standards. They're exactly what God wants for us. You know, it's what God has always wanted for his daughters. And until about 50 or 60 years ago, it's pretty much what every Catholic woman in the culture expected. And here's the kicker. It's pretty much what every Catholic woman in the culture got, you know, and the reason they got it was because they were expecting it. You know, that's what women have always traditionally done. We've set the standards and men have you know, raised themselves up to meet them. So what happened? Uh, two words, you know, sexual revolution. People started telling women who had those standards, oh, you know, let go, loosen up, have some fun. That's not the key to happiness. You know, what you really want is mad hot sex as much as possible with as many people as possible. Like, that's going to make you happy. You go for that. And women listened. <laughs> you know, who knows why they listened. And we're living in the aftermath right now. You know, women got hurt, men got hurt, families got hurt. It was bad news all around. Now, men definitely, you know, did their bit to contribute to that mess, but a lot of the blame really lies squarely on women. Women did not remember who they were. You know, they betrayed one of their, their core tasks in the culture. I'm gonna say, usually I stand up when I try to do this. Um, I'm going to tell you, in order to explain that, I'm going to tell you about a Caravaggio painting. It's one of my favorites. It's in Rome. It's called the Madonna of the Snakes. Does anyone know it? So it's awesome. In it, there's Mary and Jesus and St. Anne. I'm gonna stand up. And a great big snake. There's like a great big snake here. So Mary has her foot on the serpent's head. And Jesus, who's about 12 at the time, is standing in front of her, facing out. Mary's holding his hands, and Jesus' foot is resting on top of her foot. So you've got evil snake head, Mary foot, Jesus foot. Uh, St. Anne is standing up to the side. So the look on Jesus' face, he's not happy with the situation. You know, this is not the brave savior face. This is a little 12-year-old boy going, okay, mom, uh, not sure really what we're doing here, but there's a big snake, and I, I don't think this is such a good idea. He's a scared little boy. And then you say to Anne off to the side, who's fretful. She has the look on her face that basically says, oh, Mary, I don't know if this is such a good idea. Maybe we should give him a few more years. I don't think he's quite ready for this. But Mary's awesome. You know, Mary is calm, cool, and collected. There is nothing about her that even remotely suggests fear. Everything on her face, everything in her countenance says, this is the family business. We crush the heads of serpents. Time to man up, son, and learn what you're doing. Uh, I love that because that's what women do. That's what mothers do. 
Um, and that's what the church says we're all called to be. You know, if you want to look at all of the wonderful things the church has to say about women, probably the most fundamental is that we're all called to be mothers, you know, always in spirit, sometimes in body. Um, and one of the most fundamental tasks of, of mothering, of nourishing and nurturing life, is being a child's first teacher in the virtues. So you know how this works in the home. The mom teaches the two-year-old to say please and thank you and not to hit their siblings and to share their toys. Well, what has always been true in the natural order has also always been true in the cultural order. Women have been the culture's first teachers in virtue. So we've helped women to be women and men to be men and you know, we've put the civil in civilization. That's what we've done until the sexual revolution and then women tossed the bar aside and we didn't even just lower it. I mean, we joined men in kind of a mad race to the bottom to see who can be more depraved than who. Uh, and that's where we are today. Our women have been hurt and abused and neglected. Men have been all of those things, plus the unceasing flow of sex on tap has trapped some men in perpetual childhood where they can't commit, they can't give themselves to anyone, let alone be a father. And there's kids who've been hurt from divorce. And then there's all of us, you know, there's single men and women who've been trying to do things right, but the pool of people who are doing things right is not a great big one. Uh, when people tell you to compromise your standards, they're telling you to leave this pool and go join the other pool, you know, to go date the spiritually wounded and to become the spiritually wounded. I know it doesn't always look like that, you know, when you're on the ground, that's kind of the bird's eye view, but, you yeah. know, that's, how do I say this? When we're, when we're in the situation, it can seem like, all right, he's a great guy, he's kind, he loves me, he's got other virtues going, but he won't date me, Chasely. So if I just give in on this question now, if I compromise on this question, we can deal with everything else once we get past the altar. You know, I got to get him to the altar and then it's going to be okay. I'll have the great big Catholic, you know, marriage of my dreams. Uh, but it doesn't usually work that way. It doesn't work that way because most of the time girls don't get the ring. Like we all know that, you know, they get used and abused and they're left with nothing sparkly on their finger. Um, a lot of the other times it doesn't work because the compromise you make to get to the altar is not your last compromise. Um, one of the things that I didn't learn until after I had friends who were older and married is that chastity within marriage is a lot harder than chastity before marriage. You know, you think it's, it's hard to be chased when you're dating, but when suddenly the man you love is sleeping next to you every night, that makes chastity a whole heck of a lot harder. So if a guy can't date you chastely, the chances of him being able to practice chastity within marriage, very teeny tiny small. Uh, and if you can't practice chastity within marriage, what usually ends up happening is contraception. You know? So you violated chastity to get the husband. Now you're contracepting. Uh, you could go to confession. That would take care of that. Except if you go to confession, you have to actually have an intent to stop contracepting. And your husband's not game for that. No point in going to confession. So what do you do? Do you go to mass and receive communion unworthily? Do you just stop going to mass? You know, either way, the sanctifying grace meter has dropped to zero. The relationship that is supposed to be helping you get to God has led you away from God. You know, and it was all because you thought you could compromise. Um, it seems like a wild slippery slope, but sin makes you stupid. You know, it, first it blurs your moral vision, so you have a little harder time distinguishing right from wrong. And then it, then it blinds you. You can no longer tell what's right, what's wrong. And eventually you become so invested in your sin, you, know, you want to stay blind. And so you pass up any chance for healing and for grace because that would require changing your life to a degree you're not comfortable with. That's the situation our culture is in right now. Um, that's not the situation we want to be in. That does not get us to God. That leads us away from God. So, what does that mean for us? Like, can we only date guys who graduated from Franciscan with theology degrees? No, no, yes. Renata has experience. No. <laughs> some of those guys with theology degrees from Franciscan need some help. Um, yes, we all know one, don't we? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But it does mean we have to go back to the standards. You know, we only date a guy who's willing to date chastely. 
And that does not mean do as much as we can possibly do before we have to go to confession. It means real chastity, like a guy who understands the language of the body you know, and is willing to love according to God's plan. It also means we date men who respect our faith. That does not mean it's kind of cool with the fact that you go to Mass on Sundays. You know, that's not respecting your faith. I'm talking about a guy who admires you because of your virtue, who, if he doesn't know a lot about the faith, is at least willing to learn more, and who shows some sign that he is willing to grow in faith and virtue alongside of you. Protestants are not off limits, but if you're going to date a Protestant, you have to be ready to go in and know that there's going to have to be some serious conversations, that you're going to have to clearly communicate what you believe, you know, why you believe it, and that you're not compromising on those beliefs. You know, if you want to marry within the church, you have to agree to raise the kids Catholic and go to Mass on Sundays. And so that's not always going to be easy if you and your Protestant boyfriend or Protestant husband can't come to some sort of agreement. Uh, so standards, stick to those standards. It can seem impossible at times to find a guy who meets those standards, but I promise you it's not. I've had friends who've married guys who stuck to all those standards. I'm sure there's a few out there left for the rest of us, you know. Um, and, you know, regardless, singleness, for however long it lasts, if it's another year, another 10 years, it's not the heaviest cross in the world. It's a cross, but let me tell you, after being single 15 years longer than I thought I would be single, I would much rather have this cross than be walking around bearing the wounds of some of the women I know who have been used and abused and neglected. I would rather be single than be trapped in a bad marriage that never should have been. And I would much rather be single than have cut myself off from God. Yeah. The singleness is the cross God has outfitted for us for however long. Like He's going to give us the grace to deal with it. Uh, and it's just smarter to hold on to the cross that you're being given the grace to deal with rather than chucking it off the one that you are not being given the grace to deal with. So that is my long first principle that... Holiness is not a husband is the goal of our life. Second is that God has work for us to do, and he expects us to do it and do it well. Um, he actually has lots of things for us to do. You know, he has things for us to learn and people to love and places to go. But we're women, and so we tend not to have existential crises over those things. You know, we don't go into a, the throes of anxiety when someone says, you have to love your friend in need, or you need to learn about the feminine genius. You know, we can handle that. Uh, what does sort of send us into existential crises are questions about work and career. Some of us overvalue the work we do. Some of us undervalue the work we do. But most of us, at some point, start to panic going, how do I make decisions about a career when a guy could come at any point and change things? Or are the decisions I'm making getting in the way of me meeting the man God has for me? Um, those are hard questions and there's no easy answer. You know, it's a real fine line between losing your life to your work and letting your hopes for the present cloud your understanding of what God is asking you to do right now. Um, there's nobody other than you who can figure those things out. I can give you some principles that, that have helped me uh, and that can maybe help you through some of the confusion. And the first of those principles is just what I said. God has something for you to do right now. You know, God did not give you a mind and any number of abilities to make a job that won't intimidate a man your number one career priority. The church has been talking for almost the last century about, about the need for women to bring our feminine genius for nourishing and nurturing life into the professional world. You know, there needs to be mothers in the law firms and hospitals as much as there needs to be mothers in the home. There needs to be women who are making people feel valued or making sure that the human person stays at the center of all of our professional or public activity. Uh, and because we don't have any kids, we're like on the front line for answering that call. You know? So for as long as we're single, we need to figure out what work God has for us to do. Uh, that's a question for discernment. You look at your interests, your abilities, your opportunities, you seek wise counsel, wise counsel. But once you figure it out, you do it. And you do it without worrying what anybody else thinks. You know, we don't, we're trying to impress God, you know, not our parents and not our bosses and not our friends. We can get, we can get so caught up in our culture in the what, 
what you're doing and who your boss is. And that's the DC line. Who's your boss? Who's your boss? Um, you know, that becomes the focus. And that shouldn't be the focus. Like, the focus is what God wants for us. And sometimes what he wants for us, it does not make sense to the world. Uh, that's not only because he knows what's best for us, but he also has the long view. He knows where he's leading us, and he knows the steps we need to take to get there. Ten years ago, I left D.C., uh, and I, I turned down three different job offers from the Bush administration, plus the job offer on Capitol Hill, to go take a $15,000 a year job writing grants in a broken down steel town in Ohio. You know, my parents thought I had lost my ever loving mind. Um, my boss thought I had lost my mind. Every friend I had in Washington, with the exception of like two or three, thought I had lost my mind. I mean, who turns down your great job with the administration to go for $15,000 a year in an ugly town where the sun never shines? Um, but I knew it was what God wanted me to do. I, I had prayed and prayed and prayed, and that really seemed the right thing. It was the way I could get the theology education I wanted, and I didn't have to mortgage my future to the Student Loan Corporation. Uh, as it turns out, it was the right thing for me to do. You know, that's the job that set me up for the work I have now, where I get to work from home and on my own schedule and talk to cool people all the time and just repeat what they say in different words. Like, it's a great job. I have a great job, but I never would have had it if I had listened to what everyone else wanted me to do. Um, and God has something great for you to do, too. But again, it's You've got to focus on what he wants for you and not what everyone else in their culture expects you to do. Once you figure it out, you need to do it well. You need to do it well because that's what it means to be a Christian. You know, everything we do is meant to glorify God. And mediocrity does not glorify God. Uh, we also need to do it because I always say I'm my own husband. You know, I'm like, for now, the responsibility of providing for me is mine. Uh, and the same holds true for you guys. You know, as long as we're single, we all have the responsibility of providing for ourselves and looking out for ourselves in the future. And mediocrity, again, is not going to get that job done. But the last reason that we need to do what we do well is because when the husband and babies do come, it actually can make your life a whole lot easier. Um, I'm not sure where everyone is at when it comes to how they think about work and career. I mean, some of you may think that if you do get married and babies come, you're going to keep right on doing what you're doing. You know, nothing is going to change. Um, I'm guessing more likely there's a lot of you who think as soon as the baby shows up, it's going to be bye-bye office and hello mommy blog. You know, full-time mother, here I come. The thing is, it never looks that simple. It almost never looks that simple once the babies actually do show up. You know, even if you think you love your job and want nothing to change, there's a baby in your arms. You don't want to hand the baby over to a daycare provider who's going to be the first person to see the baby smile or take his first steps. Uh, and you may think you're going to give some Fisher like a serious run for her money. But the truth is, sometimes we can't afford to stay home. You know, there's bills to be paid and there's student loans that are mounting and your husband's not making enough or your husband loses his job. And... You've got to have. You've got to go back to work. I've had friends in both of those situations, and they're always torn apart by the decisions they have to make. You know, they don't feel like there is a good solution. They have to leave the baby they love, or they have to live in mounting financial stress. The women I've known who've had the easiest time and not had those problems did one of two things. Uh, some just didn't pursue careers or take on huge amounts of student loans that would get in the way of them having the freedom to do what they wanted to do. Uh, but God doesn't always necessarily call us into those types of careers. So the other ones are the ones who are the most successful when they were single. Uh, my Brid neighbor Bridget's a good example of this. Bridget was a Harvard educated, Harvard educated chemist. You know, she got her PhD at Harvard and then went to work at Abbott Laboratories in Chicago, which is one of the top pharmaceutical companies in the world. Uh, Bridget was tremendously successful. And uh, when she decided she wanted to quit and have a family, Abbott begged her to stay. You know, there's, they bent over backwards to find a way for her to stay. They said, well, you can work from home part time. You can come to the office in the summers. You could work on a schedule that works with family. You do whatever you want. We just want to keep you. And so Bridget does now. She works from home part time in her attic. And then in the summers when her husband isn't teaching, they go back to Chicago and she works in the labs there. My friend Monica is another great example of this. Monica was an attorney at DOJ under Bush, 
And when she decided she wanted to have her family, she was going to take on some consulting work. It was kind of how she thought they could help make ends meet. And she had law firms and lobbying firms lined up around the block to get her to consult for them. Um, if I had a husband and kids, I would be a good example of it, just because I've sort of pursued a career path that has allowed me to work from home and on my own schedule. You know, and I didn't do that by being content to hang out as an administrative assistant on Capitol Hill. You know, I pursued my education. I worked on perfecting my craft. I networked. You know, I made sure that I could be good at what I was doing so that if the husband ever does show up, you know, I'll be able to stay home with the, hus with the kids. Uh, not everyone has a career, a sort of a skill set that will allow them to make those types of choices. But it's definitely something worth considering. You know, most of my married girlfriends always say that they would give them minor or major appendage to go back and just add on a, a different degree or to maybe do their graduate education a little bit differently or shift the focus of their career path, taking different jobs with different companies in a way that would allow them to work more easily from home. Um, again, you know, that doesn't work out for everybody, but it's at least worth asking. You know, the one thing everyone in this room has right now is time uh, and you won't have that once the husband and babies show up. So use it wisely. I'm going to go back now and put a great big caveat on everything I've just said because I want to make sure it's clear. When I say successful, I don't mean make your work your life. You know, that's a bad idea. Like, work, no matter how great and meaningful it is, is never going to fill the hole in our lives that God and friends and prayer and well-spent leisure time are meant to fill. You know, if you pursue your career at the expense of your life, you will be unhappy now. Plus, while it is not exactly our job to go out and hunt ourselves down a man, you know, that man does need to be able to find you. And unless he is the UPS man who is delivering packages to your cubicle, <laughs> you need to be out there living your life. You know, you, you need to have time in your life for him and he needs to meet you. Uh, so don't make your work your life. Be successful, but hold it all loosely. Make sure you find the balance. Uh, another caveat or maybe a fear that I want to address is this idea that if we're too successful, no man is ever going to love me. You know, that whole don't find a job that's going to intimidate a man thing. That's just illogical. You know, <laughs> like if you are doing what God has asked you to do and you are doing it well, the man God has for you is going to love you for exactly those reasons. You know, he's going to love you because you are being the woman God has called you to be. And if he does not love you, for being the woman God has called you to be. He is not the right guy. Uh, now, I know in some ways it can be easy to be like, well, she's still single and she's saying that, so we're not sure. You know, but look around the city. There are so many intelligent, successful women who are married, very happily so. You know, their success did not intimidate the man God had for them. It actually helped attract him in lots of cases. Um, another really silly fear that we can buy into is the idea that if we do something now, like take that missionary trip to China or take the reporting job in Rome, go back to grad school, it's going to get in the way of the husbands and the babies. Um, the only way it's going to get in the way of the husbands and the babies is if it's not God's will for you. Now, if it is God's will for you, it's not going to get in the way of marriage. God doesn't work like that. He's not standing up in heaven going, well, I have my will behind door one and my will behind door two, which will she choose? You know, if God is calling you to marriage and he's calling you to China, you know, both things can happen. God's will in one area cannot contradict God's will in another area. So if China is God's plan for you, maybe you're going to meet your spouse in China. You know, if the reporting job in Rome seems to be the door God is opening, maybe that job is part of what God is using to prepare you to be the wife and mother that you need to be. You know, if it's God's will for you, it's definitely preparing you to be the type of woman you need to be. So sum up. Follow God's will, follow it fearlessly, do it well, you know, and you will be rewarded. If you don't follow God's will, you know, there's going to be some person out there who needed what you had to give, you know, some job that needed to be done. It's not going to get done. Like God made you to do something, you know, some special task that only you can do as well as you can do. And he's asking you to take that on. You don't take it on. You could end up like the servant in the parable of the talents. You know, the one who had had his little one talent, and he was so scared to use it that he just thought he'd go and bury it. And then the master came back, and he proudly presented him. He's like, "Look, I didn't screw anything up." And he went off to the dungeon. 
you know, you don't want to go to the dungeon. I don't want to go to the dungeon. Dungeons aren't pretty. And pretty is really, really big with me. Um, so that brings us to the third point, uh, that the means for joy in life are always sufficient. Uh, let's see here. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story about my friend, Sarah, who's 25, maybe 26 now. And last summer, she was having a really hard time with being single. You know, she had this idea in her head that she was going to be married by the time she was 25. And when things weren't going according to plan, she panicked. So she sent me a long email asking for advice. And at the end of it, she said, you know, Emily, I don't know how you do this whole thing, single thing so well. If I were 36 and single, I would jump off a bridge. I was like, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Once I finished laughing, I, you know, responded back to her and said, one, I don't always do the single thing so well. You know, I just cry behind closed doors. I don't, you know, talk about it as much. Uh, but two, I told her the only way I got to be 36 and single without jumping off a bridge is because I didn't spend the last 10 years thinking about being 36 and single. If I had, I might have jumped off a bridge. Um, that's because that's all I would have seen, you know, like 30, so I'm 37. Now I had my birthday last week. So 37 and single, you know, those two stark realities. I would have seen everything else. I wouldn't have seen all of the people that God gave me to love. I wouldn't have seen all of the opportunities to grow and serve and travel that would come my way. I wouldn't have seen the grace. I wouldn't have seen Christ. I wouldn't have seen how much more in love with him I would fall. And I certainly wouldn't have seen how he would use my struggles with singleness to bring me closer to him. Nobody can. You know, that's not how life works. We don't get to see the future. We don't get the grace to deal with the future. We've got the present moment and the present grace for the present troubles. And so we have got to stay in the moment. We have to focus on the present joys you know, and be grateful for those. And there will be joys. Uh, God doesn't just want us to be joyful. He made us to be joyful. You know, he expects us to be joyful. And what God expects, he gives you the grace to make possible. And so he will give you so many little bits of consolation and beauty. You just have to be open to seeing them. A few years ago, I was really sick. And you know what happens when you're really, really sick, like, like surgery, serious health problems sick. You know how that works when you're Catholic and everyone's sending the emails around and this person's praying for you and this person's asking for prayers. And one of my friends who is so much sweeter and more pious and holier than I am sent me an email and said, Emily, I am praying that Christ will be your only consolation. To which my unholy, unpious self responded, stop. You know, I was like, don't pray that. Stop right now. I'm, and I explained to her, I love Christ and I want to be consoled by him, but I also plan on being consoled by pumpkin spice lattes and my friends and maybe a new cream turtleneck sweater, you know, and that's okay. Like we're Catholic. We, we get the incarnation. We get that God has made this beautiful world for us and he wants us to rejoice in it and he wants us to see him in it. You know, God just doesn't come to us through the Eucharist. God comes to us through tulips and hot chocolate and little children. And he's everywhere, like in everything in creation, every bit of beauty we can see God. Um, and when we have, when we recognize that and we make sure we're looking for that, we find joy. You know? Beauty, beauty really is a window through which we see God. It heals, it consoles, it comforts. I think it's the... Not very good with my communion and liberation people, but the head guy, Jusani, right? Is Jusani the head? He says that beauty is the one thing in the world that doesn't lead to doubt in God. I love that, not just because it's beautiful, but also because it really says something important to women. The church has always taught that we're the beautiful sex, and that doesn't just mean that we're better at being than men. You know, it means that we image the beauty of God. You know, there's something about us, about our form, our figure, our skin that reflects a God who is beauty in a way that, you know, the beauty of man does not. Uh, we don't just image the beauty of God, we image how God sees his children, you know, in men's desire for us. Um, we image the way that God sees, the desire God has for each and every human soul, you know, how he sees us as beautiful and lovable and worth pursuing for all eternity. That's why women have a special relationship with beauty. 
we tend to need it more than men. We tend to be more sensitive to it. Now, there's always exceptions. There are men who are very sensitive to beauty and women who aren't. But in general, you know, women tend to be affected much more by the beautiful. As such, we have a call to cultivate the beautiful. Uh, sometimes that's just making something, making something that makes the world a little bit more lovely. So sewing or knitting or painting or photography like Renata. Um, I like to restore old houses. You know, I mean, there's co composing music or writing poetry, any sort of beautiful thing. When a woman does it, she tends to find great joy. It's a creative act. It's a life giving act. It reflects who God made her to be. It reflects the feminine genius. Uh, so when you're really down, you know, go make something beautiful. Uh, you're also called to make yourself beautiful. And when I say make yourself beautiful, I don't mean make yourself beautiful in the way that culture tells us to make ourselves beautiful. You know, trying to fit ourselves into some tiny little box of what X magazine on X day and X year says is sexy and hot. You know, we don't want to be sexy or hot. If I could erase one word from the English language right now, it would be sexy. Um, we are not called to image Brooklyn Decker. You know, we are called to image God and God is not sexy. There is nothing in God that could be a synonym for smutty or risque or dirty or bodacious or toothsome or erotic. God is not smutty or bodacious. He's just not, you know, God is beautiful. God is goodness. You no, know? God is wisdom. God is gentleness. God is rich in mercy. God is love. That's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to pursue. And in our pursuit of it, we're supposed to make sure that the beauty we're cultivating interiorly shows up on the outside. We don't want to muddy it up with smuttiness or grumpiness. Um, the smuttiness is really easy because it's easy to be smutty. It's just what the culture tells us to do. You know, if we dress the way the culture tells us, if we act the way the culture tells us, if we talk the way the culture tells us, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of work. Don't have to reflect on much. Um, grumpy is kind of easy too. You know, we can just go hide out in our basement and hang out with cats in our sweats. That's, you know, that's easy. It's hard to be beautiful. It's hard to be fashionable and modest, you know, to be virtuous and elegant, to, to be lovely. Like it takes work. It takes work to find clothes at the mall that make us not look like we just stepped off the stage at Jim's Gentleman Club. Um, I had a problem the other day. I went out looking for shoes and I was like, man, this is what the hookers who used to live down the street from me wore. Like, it's, how are you supposed to find a pair of shoes that aren't trashy? Um, it takes work just because you're continually trying to evaluate fashion trends that come out. It's like, okay, skinny jeans. How do I make skinny jeans possibly be modest? Now, if I wear a long enough sweater and maybe we do these boots, you know, you're, you're constantly having to reflect as, as fashion trends emerge. But it doesn't just take work in that way. It takes work in that it requires a lot of humility. Um, Victoria and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand. All of us, every woman in this room, we have been lied to since the day we were born about what is beautiful. And in some way or other, we've been poisoned by that. And that poison doesn't just disappear from our system the day we decide to get serious about our faith. You know, it might linger in an attachment we have to a certain kind of clothing. It might linger in our language. It might linger in the way we interact with men or the way we interact with women. Um, it might just linger in our desires and our intentions, you know, but it's there. And the only way we can extract that poison is to become conscious of it and make a very concerted effort to get it out. And that becoming conscious of it isn't fun because we have to put everything we have in our, you know, under this microscope and look at it through the lens of the church's teachings and be brutally honest with ourselves when there's something that's not measuring up. And then we have to have the courage to change it. And that means sometimes we don't get to be as cool or as relevant as we'd like or wear the outfit we want to wear. Um, but that's what God's asking us to do. You know, that's, that's where the joy is. If we pursue beauty the way the culture is telling us, we will lose the joy we have. You know, we'll be signing up to be treated like an object, to be seen like an object. Um, you know, there's spiritual dangers, there's physical dangers like eating disorders, like Pursuing the culture's type of beauty is not the path to joy. The path to joy is pursuing the beauty God calls us to. And it's just more fun to be beautiful that way. You know, sexy is the same. Like, sexy is so boring. It, it's Everyone's doing it these days. There's nothing scintillating about it. It's like they've just sort of put this mask on themselves that hides who they truly are. 
But when you're pursuing true beauty, you get to be who you are. You know, you're not becoming some Stepford Catholic girl with, you know, everyone has to be in long hair and long skirts and chapel veils. Um, I look very bad in long hair, so I'm not going to tell that to anybody. You know, it's you get to be you. And being you is fun. Being you is joyful. Knowing you're loved for being you is joyful. Um, last thing I want to say here is that there's only one way to really figure that out, and that's to grow closer to God. You know, God may not be the only bit of joy in our lives, but he is the ultimate source of joy. You know, God is joy himself. And if we want to stay sane and happy while we're single, like, we have no choice but to fall madly and deeply in love with God. Like he is the alpha and omega of sanity, both when you're single and long after you're no longer single. Uh, falling in love with God is kind of like falling in love with a guy. You know, you got to spend time with him. You got to get to know him. So you go to mass, you go to adoration, you read about him in the Bible and in books when you do something that hurts, you know, when you screw up, you go to confession, say you're sorry, you admit what you've done wrong, and you talk to him all the time. Um, the talking to him is sometimes hard, especially when you're not happy with him. You know, my, my little friend Sarah, again, this summer, she, this last summer when I got that email, I told her, I was like, pray, Sarah. And she said, I don't know what to say to him anymore. You know, she was, <laughs> she was so frustrated of going to him again and again, being like, husband, God, husband, and not getting the husband. She's kind of done. You know, they were, they weren't on speaking terms at that point. And I told her, well, when you don't know what to say to God, then you tell God you don't know what to say to him. You know, God needs, God doesn't need to hear everything we have to say, but we need to tell him. You know, when we're happy, we have to tell him we're happy. When we're sad, we have to tell him we're sad. When we're angry, we tell him we're angry. If all we can do is stand and yell at the picture of the Sacred Heart in our hallway, then we need to stand and yell at the picture of the Sacred Heart in our hallway. I mean, it's not in general a good idea to yell at God, but God would rather have you yelling at him than not talking to him. Because if you're not talking to him, you know, if you've turned your back on him, you've made it a whole heck of a lot harder for him to give you the grace you need to get out of the place you're in. If you're, ta if you're yelling at him, you're at least in dialogue, you know, you're looking at him and that means he can help you. So yell and eventually you won't feel the need to yell anymore. Uh, you will be joyful and you will be hopeful. Uh, hoping really is the key. Like I know we can all hit a certain point where we're just done. Uh, one of my friends this, this winter when the book came out called me up after the you know, afterwards and said she loved the book. It said everything she ever wanted a book for Catholic single women to say, but she was mad at me. And I was like, why are you mad at me? And she's like, well, you're so darn hopeful. You know, and she went on to explain, you know, I'm, I'm tired of hoping. Like, I'm tired of, you know, I would rather just expect the worst. And if the worst happens, I won't be disappointed. And if something better happens, then great. I'll be pleasantly surprised. I get that. Like, I do. You know, look at me. I'm Irish, obviously, you know, and we Irish people can give uh, the Russians a run for their money when it comes to pessimism. Uh, but when it comes to questions of vocation, no one is allowed to channel their inner Irishman. Like, it's just not allowed. We've got to hope. We have to hope because it's reality. People are getting married every day over the age of 30 or 35 or 40 or whatever the magic number in your head is. Um, I think my favorite thing about doing this book is everywhere I go, someone has a story for me now. You know, they want to tell me about their cousin who got married at 37 or their aunt who got married at 45. Or My favorite story was um, someone's great aunt got married at 75 for the first time. And I was like, awesome. Like, that will be me. If I am not married when I'm 80 and I'm getting checked into the nursing home, I am going to be scoping out the old guys in the wheelchair going, hmm, he looks kind of cute. Maybe he's the one I'm supposed to marry. You know, the only expiration on a vocation to marriage is death. So hope always, it is a reflection of reality. God is healing people all the time, making that small pool bigger. The other reason we have to hope is because the opposite of hope is despair. And despair is a really, really bad thing. You know, it is a big, bad sin in and of itself. And it's a sin that leads us to commit all other sorts of bad sins. You know, it's despair that makes us decide we're going to date the guy we know we shouldn't date despair that makes us do things with the guy we know we shouldn't do. It's despair that makes us bitter and hard and frigid, you know, the very embodiment of what the culture says we're going to be if we do the single life the church's way and not the culture's way. Um, and worst of all, despair is what turns us in on ourselves. You know, when you're despairing, you're self-absorbed. You don't see the needs and the struggles of the people around you, and you can't love them in the way that they need to be loved. So don't despair. Hope. So I always say it's the linchpin of joy. You know, if you don't have hope, every other source of joy is going to just turn to ash. 
So those are my three principles. You know, holiness, not a husband, is the goal of your life. God has work for you to do now, and he expects you to do it. And the means for joy in life are always sufficient. Um, I can't guarantee that if you follow faithfully all of these principles, you will be sane and happy every minute of your life. I can pretty much guarantee you won't be, since I'm definitely not sane and happy every day. Uh, but I can guarantee if you follow these principles, they will keep you on the path towards God. You know, they will keep you on the path towards joy. And they'll also help the culture. You know, it's not just us that needs to stay on this path. Our culture is one great big mess right now. You know, and they, people in the culture desperately need to see single women who are practicing chastity and witnessing to authentic femininity and beauty and trusting in the midst of suffering. Um, you guys know the lies as well as I do, you know, the lies that women hear every day. Like, our worth is about our sexual desirability. Uh, if we want to be beautiful, we need to look like the bikini clad babe on the Budweiser billboard. If we want to be happy, we need to have lots of sex with lots of different people. Uh, if we want motherhood, you know, is a choice on the level of buying an iPod or going to France, not an ontological call that expresses the deepest truths of our being. Uh, success is all about money or your title and suffering is something to be avoided at all costs. You know, if you're suffering, do whatever you can, pop a pill, take a drink, buy a dress, sleep with the guy, just get away from the suffering, run. Um, those are lies. They're damned lies, but people hear them so often, they believe them. And they never connect the lies with their, their believing, with the pain that they're feeling. And the reason they don't make that connection is because no one in their life is helping them make it. You know, they don't know anyone who's witnessing to authentic femininity or living chastity. They don't know there's another way to do it. And that's, that's our job <laughs> you know, for as long as we're single, whether it's for six months or six years or longer, like the church is asking us to step up and be those witnesses, you know, to show them what femininity looks like, to show them that chastity is the path to wholeness and joy. And, you know, so just show them how to suffer when you're not getting what you want. It's not a fun witness all the time. Sometimes it is. Um, it's not the witness I signed up for, you know, 10 years ago when I came back into the church and got really serious about my faith. I thought I was signing up for the 10 kids and the homeschool co-op witness. Um, God had other plans and that is okay. You know, I can honestly say, and writing the book has been really helpful for me in reflecting on this. I'm glad I didn't get married at 25. I'm glad I didn't get married at 30. You know, I know that all this time I've had alone with God is going to make me a much better wife and a much better mother if that husband ever comes. And I would love it if I went home tomorrow to Stephenville and that husband were on my doorstep. You know, don't get me wrong. But if he's not, which he probably won't be, you know, I know that God's going to keep on using the time that I have left alone with him to make me into an even better wife and mother. And he's going to do the same for you. Um, I said it in the book, and I'm just going to close by saying this here. I was like, God is hopefully for those of us seeking marriage, not the husband we're going to end up with in this lifetime. You know, it would be Nice to have a real flesh and blood, non-Eucharistic man who we can marry. Um, but God's still the husband we're going to end up with in eternity. You know? And that means he's going to be there for us now. He's going to give us the grace to be the witnesses he's calling us to be. And someday all the frustration and the confusion and the loneliness and the questioning, it's all going to make sense. And it's not just going to be making sense. It's also going to be beautiful because if it is God's will, it can't be anything else. So that is what I have to say. Um, I'm happy if you guys want to talk about things or ask questions or offer comments or throw rotten tomatoes or whatever you want to do. So.